Am I audible, everyone? Okay, thanks, Prashant. We'll wait a few minutes and start at nine o five p.m. Okay.
Okay, guys, it's nine o five. I think we should begin. A very good evening to everyone. I am Ditesh Kanojia, and today we are going to be discussing question answering and multilingual NLP. Now, both of these are very broad topics in the sense that question answering sort of encompasses not just a single task. It's not like relationship extraction where a single classification task can supposedly give you some sort of answers question answering has different paradigms i will explain all of them to you and of course we will start with establishing a motivation for question answering we'll try to understand the problem and why it is needed still we'll look at some applications as well and then we'll talk about the different paradigms and types of question answering systems that have been prevailing and after uh, talking about all the systems we'll then move on to multilinguality and cross lingual nlp and we'll talk a little bit about the indic nlp library and how indian languages are so confusing uh, for processing for machines we'll discuss some of the popular cross lingual word representations and then end this lecture there so one of the major challenges for artificial intelligence as an area is to create machines which are responsive and not just responsive but responsive in a natural conversational setting so a few days ago one of you was talking to me about a competition where chatbot where it's supposedly a chatbot was uh, something that you needed to deploy and uh, there is something called a turing test i am not sure if you are aware of it or not but do look it up it's one of the most uh, sacred ways to evaluate an artificial intelligence intelligence based agent or a machine as to if a machine has so the turing test basically says that if a machine has really achieved artificial intelligence quote and quote or ai it means that the machine the human at the other end talking to the machine would not be able to recognize whether on the other end the person talking the 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 responses are coming from a machine or from a human being so in a natural conversational setting so a chatbot which can reply absolutely naturally and does not let you feel that you're talking to a machine is something that uh, has been i'm getting a call just yes professor i'm sorry guys that was an interruption but let's get back so uh making a chatbot is not something that we are aiming at the end of this very lecture but trying to understand how question answering as a problem has evolved from the beginning and what kind of paradigms have been prevailing in question answering task or sub task is something that we need to understand first okay so this brings us the overall uh, big picture that i just talked about of int artificial intelligence and a turing test and a very natural chatbot this brings us to the task where a machine should be able to answer any questions which we asked it and those answers can be based on either the prior knowledge or a database that machine has or based on web search okay so question answering is a very response to the question what if machines could talk to us and textual question answering is something that we shall discuss today this is basically also a sub part of overall spoken question answering okay so textual question answering basically encompasses how machines comprehend our question and how they try and detect the answer for that question moving on so this is actually one of the oldest tasks in nlp the punched card systems in computers came in 1961 and this paper about question answering uh, about answering english questions came out in 1964 and one of the popular questions or the figures that this paper had was what do worms eat worms eat grass or an, another answer can be that horses with worms eat grass so they used the dependency parsing based logic 
to provide you the answers from the documents uh, using rule based or handcrafted patterns from the documents it had in its knowledge base or the database at the back end uh coming like really fast forward to 2011 ibm released a question answering system uh, called watson and it won the show jeopardy against the best jeopardy champions so i am linking a uh, clip of youtube in this slide if you once you get the slide do go and watch this clip on youtube and uh, th this this is uh, watson basically gave some really brilliant replies so in jeopardy what you need to do is you need to guess the question from sort of an answer so you just need a nap if if the answer that they show you on screen is you just need a nap you don't have the sleep disorder that can make sufferers nod off while standing up the watson's reply was what is narcolepsy and the winning reply against both the other human contenders given by watson was an account of the principalities of wallachia and moldova inspired this author's most fa famous novel and the author's name is bram stoker and i don't know if you are aware of it or not but the novel was dracula so there are a lot of fictional stories around dracula uh, i am sure you might have heard of some of them there are many popular movies around that fictional dracula story but originally he was just a king i believe and if you go if you get a chance to go to eastern europe there is a very beautiful castle in romania you should definitely visit it it is basically the king's castle and the king who was supposedly labeled as dracula so uh okay coming back from my fantasies to the actual applications of question answering system uh these three applications of question answering systems are currently the most popular and most used ones siri first came out uh, through apple for their iphones and ipads and it is basically a assistant for your phone which can set up alarms for you which can create for shopping lists for you similarly google assistant can do all that and maybe something on top of that in the screenshot here it's shown that when you give a calculation to google assistant to perform it basically does that and gives you the answer alexa i i am not sure if google assistant can do what alexa does but uh, again alexa can also act as an iot interface and it can turn on and turn off your lights maybe the new google assistant uh, speakers that have come out maybe they do the same thing too i'm not sure but all of these systems can answer questions for you and at the very helm of all of three these three applications popular applications siri google assistant and alexa are question answering based systems or some of the paradigms that we are going to discuss today so the generally the type of questions in modern question answering uh, scenario are either factored questions or complex questions so factored questions are easier to answer relatively so basically who wrote the universal declaration of human rights how many calories are there in two slices of apple pie so what the system would have to do is try and find a passage in the knowledge base that it has which contains the answer and then the system has to extract the answer from the passage that's the to that those are the two very basic steps so first it has to parse the question for what it needs then it goes and finds the passage and then it tries and extracts the correct answer using information extraction or information retrieval based techniques complex questions on the other hand should be answered by not not taking a span or a phrase from the passage but by either presenting the whole passage to the human being who's answering who's asking the question or by summarizing the passage so then again the a sub problem of nlp summarization comes into picture and once the machine has fetched the correct passage a summarization which is going to be a preferably a more you know a succinct answer to the question is supposedly going to be presented by your question answering system so summarization is another component which can or cannot join in 
given what kind of system you want to design if you want to design a system which just gives out the passage okay well and good but if you want a better system which gives you out a good answer and not just a complete page taken out from a knowledge graph then you probably have to add the summarization component as well so mostly commercial systems mostly answer factoid questions like where is louvre uh, louvre museum located in paris france and what are the names of odin's ravens hagen minin and what currency is used in china the yuan these are the simpler kind of questions that are answered by question answering systems the different paradigms that have uh, been there and are currently prevailing in q question and answer question answering uh, sub task are number one information retrieval based approaches so what are information retrieval based approaches the web based approaches that we discussed so google is what google does is basically it uh, has a whole lot of web pages data, uh, database of web pages it's uh, google bot basically indexes each page into a database it keeps on crawling the internet for information for more and more web pages on on a regular basis and after it has indexed all those pages whatever question you ask it it tries and looks up for an answer from the indexed data and then gives it to you at least this is what used to happen before 2012 i'll tell you what happens now so in knowledge based approaches uh, there is a knowledge graph or a database at the back end and applications like question answering systems like apple siri and wolfram alpha just ping that knowledge base and try to answer your factoid questions they either answer the factoid question or what they do is they fetch the whole passage if they do not think they have correctly recognized a specific answer from the passage what they do is they eventually get give get you the whole passage and then there are hybrid approaches which used both ir based and knowledge bases uh like watson nowadays or something called true knowledge ev so uh, if you search google even for fictional answers it, it's going to give it to you because everything that is there on the internet they have probably already indexed it so i search for what are the names of odin's ravens and it says that in norse mythology this is basically fiction uh, hygin and munin are a pair of ravens and when i search for who killed batman's parents batman itself is a fictional character and the answer was right there in front of me jo chill so before 2012 google's system was a pure information retrieval based qa but in to later they introduced a knowledge graph as well and because of the introduction of this knowledge graph you see these answers right in front of you they parse either wikipedia pages or uh, knowledge structured knowledge graphs which they know very well follow a same structure they parse them they have their they finally prepare their own knowledge graph and nowadays it is a hybrid system which uses both ir and uh, knowledge bases so the I, i'm sure you already know what a knowledge graph is you'll have a lecture probably on 6 july and then i'm going to try and explain to you how knowledge graphs are structured and wikipedia is uh, relatively unstructured but it can be considered vaguely a knowledge graph okay the ir based approach the paradigm that i talked about this figure might look a little confusing but let's look at it part by part and try and understand how question answering is done so once you have posed your question uh, i hope you can see my pointer okay once you have posed your question then your question is pruned to try and detect two things one the query that you actually want by removing the stop words and by processing the rest of the remaining words for named entities and part of speeches once your query has been formulated from your question so for example what you asked was who is the current prime minister of india and what it's going to do is remove who remove is and then let current prime minister and india as the query remain in there 
that should be your query and then answer type detection should the answer type should be a person so what you want from this question is current prime minister india and you want a person's name this goes forward and it looks at documents possibly wikipedia it looks at whatever uh, so documents have been let's let's come here first let's not go straight away here let's come here first internet is crawled for a set of documents and all of those documents are indexed into a single structure and once they have been indexed into a single structure the query is then thrown at the indexed database the relevant documents are then parsed for the answer the the uh, passage containing the correct answer is retrieved from this relevant documents and if there are multiple passages or a single passage the passage comes here now once the passage has been once a passage has been detected which contains the right answer the answer type is the name of a person and you just need to take the name of a person from the passage and you have your final answer this is how a information retrieval based approach works you have a whole ir system supporting the question answering system so this this particular portion is your ir system which has the documents indexed from the web and this portion is something that you can consider your question answering system now i hope you understand it so once so first the question is processed for detecting the type of the question for detecting detecting the type of the answer and by focus and relations it what it means here is it focuses on creating a query or formulating a query the actual query from the question and once that query has been created if there if a relationship sort of a relationship can be extracted from that query well and good then you can detect the answer as well passage retrieval is something that i have already explained it to you uh, ranked documents or indexed documents are used as database and answer processing is you extract candidate answers so what can happen is once you look at the passages from those passages you may get more than one one correct answer more than one answer and once more than one answers have been uh, have come as an output what you probably need to do is you rank those Uh, answers based on a ranking system that is also a part of your ir based factor and qa okay moving on uh, knowledge based approaches approaches we have discussed uh, semantic representations or vector representations uh, in quite detail during the past two lectures what happens here is once you have sent in a question a vector representation of that question or the query once it's been formulated from the question that vector representation is formed and this is mapped to the structured data like wikipedia dbpedia wordnet yahoo these are all uh, it says ontologies here but these are all knowledge graphs or unstructured knowledge graphs per se and once these databases have been pinged using these uh using the semantic representation then any uh, any answer which seems the closest to the semantic representation is given out to you what siri does at uh, a very high level is because uh, why we are talking about siri here is because we discussed that siri is a knowledge graph based system right so uh the for very first step siri has is it's recognizing your voice so it does automatic speech recognition and it transcribes the analog signal from your voice into text hopefully if that goes uh, goes by correctly then using uh, nlp part of speech tagging and chunking your query into uh, chunking your question into a query as we discussed and using a dependency uh, dependency parsing tree it tries to look at uh, it makes a parsed text and tries to search for a an answer so using question and intent analysis it analyzes your past past text so for example you said siri can you please schedule a meeting for me tomorrow at 8 am so what it looks basically is at is schedule a meeting siri can you please set my uh, set an alarm for me tomorrow at 8 am 
what it looks at is set my alarm. So once it has parsed your question and formulated the actual query that it needs to execute using, uh, I don't know if they use third party services any the, anymore, but uh, I, I think they have their own uh, database now. So the utterances that have been identified either as a question or a task, it uh, tries and executes those tasks then and once uh, it has an answer, un unless it is something that you have told it to do, if it's a question, once it has an answer, using the text that it has gotten back from the database or the knowledge graph at the back end, it converts it into speech and then talks to you. So this is basically a high level working of Siri. The hybrid approach is however they build a shallow semantic representation of the query so they generate multiple answer candidates using the ir methods from the indexed documents and then they augment those answers with ontologies and semi-structured data like wikipedias or wordnets and they score each candidate using knowledge uh, using the knowledge graphs that we discussed here so Wikipedia, DBpedia, WordNet, Yago, or ConceptNet, or WordNet, there are, there are so many knowledge graphs out there. Once they have gotten your answers, multiple answers, they rank those answers using the knowledge graphs. And from those knowledge graphs, whatever rank, whatever top ranked answers they have, they present to you. Let's look at, uh, so now, now that we have up discussed these approaches or paradigms, at a very high level, let's discuss how the question, how a question answering system extracts things from a question. Okay. So one thing that it definitely needs to do is try and detect your answer. So it can be a named entity type. Uh, you might be asking it for a city. What is the capital of national capital of India? Uh, the answer is Delhi. So the answer is basically answer type is basically a place. Who is the current prime president of India? The answer type is a person. Second thing it needs to do is query formulation, choose the right keywords for the IR system. The third thing it needs to do is, is this what type of a question this is? Is this a definition question? Is this a math question just like Google Assistant was answering? Is this something that I need to give a detailed answer for? So there is a question type classification as well. Uh, don't worry, we are not getting into technicalities right now. Right now I'm just trying to establish what are the components of a question answering system. We'll get into the technicalities later. Maybe not too much in details because we have to talk about multilinguality as well. But still, let us just try and establish what components belong to a QA system and how a QA system basically works. Then after question type classification, it looks at the focus of the question words and what an answer should be, what word should be replaced by the answer. And then finally, it tries to extract a relation between two entities and possibly give you an answer. So for example, your question says, which two states do you enter when you exit the state of Uttar Pradesh from the southern border? The answer type you need is an Indian state. The answer type is basically a place. The query is basically two states, border, Uttar Pradesh and South. The focus is on those two states. And then the relation that it needs to extract from your question is you need borders of Uttar Pradesh South. You need the states which borders the function, the relationship function which forms here is you need states which border Uttar Pradesh on the southern side. So answers basically would be Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. Answer type detection. Uh, who found Vistara Airlines? It should be a person. When you say who in the question, that is a definite indication of what kind of an answer you require. What Indian city? The answer type is a place. So once you have performed a named entity recognition or along with post tagging of the question, then you will easily be able to formulate what kind of an answer or what type of an answer you need to provide the user. So uh, uh, I won't go back and state the importance of the NLP layers again and again, but this is why the very basics like post tagging and named entity recognition, despite the fact that these have been uh, very old prevailing problems in NLP, 
uh, they are still very popular and these are some these are these such tasks are basically the holy grail of nlp if you have cracked them then you have probably done real good the answer type taxonomy is something that jinli and dan roth came up with in 2002 in their paper what they came up with uh, so basically uh, if you try to pose question answering as a problem where you need to classify your type of answer you need to classify your type of questions then you need to have certain types of classes and certain type of taxonomy or a structure present right what they did was they manually created this after studying lots and lots of questions and what they came up with was six course classes of there's a spelling mistake here i'm sorry abbreviation entity description human location and numeric and then from these six classes they came up with 50 sub classes like location human entity animal body color currency and there are so many you, you might just have to go and look at jinli and dan roth's paper i i will of course share these slides with you just look at the names of these authors up on the internet and say question answering 2002 jinli dan roth and you'll probably find the paper the taxonomy they created was something like this so the six course classes are represented in the middle and some of the uh, uh, classes that are sub classes for these are presented outside so numeric can be date or percentage or distance or money or size a human can be a individual or a title or a, it could be talking about multiple humans in a group an abbreviation could be an expression it could be an abbreviation or an acronym in itself the location could be a country city or state this is how the taxonomy looks like so once you have detected your uh, question once you have processed your question and detected your question type and the answer type then you uh, then answer type detection has different methodologies which have been prevailing let's talk about the handwritten or the rule based methodology first so remember when we talked about regular uh, relationship extraction we said that there are some rule based methods which have been uh, used in the past which use regular expressions similarly for question answering there have been methods which used regular expression uh, based rules and which can get you some cases so example who is was are were person so basically person is the uh, kind of answer that you are looking for when you say who that means you are looking for a person so if you parse a question based on regular expressions and look for words like who or what or where then you will probably be able to detect your answer type using handwritten rules or handwritten regular expressions but again the problem with any handwritten or rule based method is that you will have to type in or code in all the rules that are possible that is why these systems fail and that is why they have gone out of considerably gone out of fashion then comes in machine learning so most often you treat uh, the problem of answer type detection as a classification problem so you try and classify the, but this this is this is always always a multi class classification in a question answering system i don't think there is a probability of a binary classification you'll have to classify your answer type in either uh, so if you look at lee and roth's taxonomy you'll have to basically classify them into either of those six classes first and then the rest of uh, then the rest of the subclasses further so you define a taxonomy of question types just like g and roth did you annotate some training data with each question type so uh, remember when you create a training data for a supervised method you have to have a substantial number so if if it's let us not even get into multi class classification first if it's a binary classification yes or no zero or one even then for the machine learning system to be able to identify or predict the answer correctly the model has to be trained on a substantial number of samples substantial number of yes samples and substantial number of no samples imagine and and you understand how 
a good data set is very much a requirement of a machine learning uh, classifier right imagine for a multi class classifier how important a good data set is when you have to you basically need a substantial number of examples for not just one class but for all the classes and you need good answers as well so such data sets used to be really scarce before i think trec as a data set came out trec also held held competitions uh, on question answering uh, at that point of time and right now i think squad stanford we will talk about it squad is the data set which people prefer to use and squad also has two different versions so once you annotate the training data for each question type for remember for each class there have to be a lot of questions lot of answers and then you train your classifier for each question class using features features can be either those handwritten rules or the semantic representations that we have been discussing for the past very many classes okay so the features for the answer type detection can be the question words and phrases the part of speech tags the parse features like head words or like who what when where exact uh, etc the named entities which may be present in the question or semantically related words two words which are closer to each other so let's look at this system again passage retrieval and answer uh, answer ranking is something that we're going to discuss so passage retrieval is something that is done here and answer ranking is done here okay so in step 1 i've already explained the system to you in detail i i actually planned to explain it here at this slide but i think i got a little excited and explained everything to you earlier but the ir engine basically retrieves your documents which are which have been indexed uh, and from those indexed documents using your query terms whatever uh, passages it can match using your query terms it gets those passages let's go back so this is where your indexed documents are from your query type it looks at the relevant documents and retrieves the passages for you okay then it segments the documents into shorter units something like paragraphs and then the passages are ranked based on the answer type okay so the features for passage ranking can be the number of named entities that are uh of the right type in the passage so if your answer type is a person that you have already detected then the passages that you have obtained will be ranked based on how many named entities are present in this passage so that is one of the features then number of query words which are present in the passage so if your number of query words were 5 are only four of those present in the passage or all five of those present in the passage so the all these features can be given some sort of weightage number of named entities number of query words number of question engrams not just the query words that you have formulated from the actual question but if you look at the whole question and you try to form engrams uh, basically unigrams trigrams trigrams or four grams and then look For, uh, for all those in the passages that you have retrieved from the document set this this feature probably may be given less weightage okay uh, higher weightage to uh, the query words i guess and then the proximity of query words to each other in the passage so if there is a single line in the passage which contains the query words and then a person's name if a person type answer you're looking for is then you've hit the jackpot then the longest sequence of question words and the rank of the document containing passage these are the features you can use to rank the passages that you retrieve here and once those passages have been ranked the top k or the top few passages are then sent for answer processing how is answer processing or answer extraction done is you run the answer type named entity tagger on the passages that you have retrieved now and each answer type requires a named entity tagger if the type is city it uh, if the type is a person is something that you try and extract from the passage and once you get the correct answer you return the string with the right type so uh, if the question is who is the prime minister of india and the answer type is person 
then the passage containing narendra modi the prime minister of india stated that none of the chinese soldiers had entered the galwan valley narendra modi should be extracted from that passage how tall is mount everest if wikipedia says the official height of mount everest everest is 29035 feet then 29035 feet as a length or a number from the taxonomy should be extracted from it so ranking candidate answers how it is done is the answer type the correct answer type should be matched there can be a regular expression pattern that matches the candidate it's not necessary that the exact answer type is what you get you may get a passage based on the regular expression pattern the question keywords of basically how many question keywords are present in the candidate answer what is the actual keyword distance between the words and the candidate and query keywords so the query keywords that you had formulated and the answer that you have gotten what is the distance between them and whatever answers that you get after parsing the passages those answers are answers are ranked based on these features similar to what happened here passage ranking is happening for the answers and once you have ranked the answers then basically what you do is you present the user with either top one or top two answers based on how you want how your system wants to answer the question now that we have discussed how these uh, paradigms work or how machine learning or these feature sets come into the picture this is something really important that i want to discuss with you the most popular data set for question answering problem right now is squad so if you are doing if you are basically doing nlp on question answering especially for english then you must must evaluate your architecture or your methodology or your approach whatever you want to call it on squad and compare it with the current state of the art so the squad 1.0 or the first squad data set word that came out had 100000 examples it's it was a huge data set even at that point of time and in squad 1.1 basically what happened was the initial system the authors collected three gold answers for questions and systems the systems uh, that uh, were competed in the competition were scored on two metrics so just like trec used to host a competition squad data set creators also hosted a competition and people created question answering systems and tried to you know answer the questions using the squad data set and they were scored on two metrics so the f1 measure is one of the more popular measures uh, which was seen as reliable and taken as the primary score uh, both the metrics that they had uh, ignored punctuations and articles squad 2.0 uh, basically came out because they identified that 1.0 Uh, is uh, had some problems so the questions all the questions have an answer in the paragraph but what are the questions uh, what if the questions are, do not have an answer in the paragraph what if you have to extract the answer from somewhere else so the systems basically what they do is they uh, what they did for squad 2.0 when they were competing for the task they implicitly ranked the candidate answers and whatever they chose best they just gave it as an output so it it is not necessary whether an exact uh, span of answer by span of answer i mean a phrase is an answer to the question you can basically give a paragraph as well so in squad 2.0 one third of the training questions have no answer at the in the data set and half of the development or test questions have no answer at all so for no answer examples no answer receives a score of 1 and any other response gets zero for both exact match and f1 and the simplest system approach to squad 2.0 is that you have a threshold score for whether a span answer a question or not okay moving on from question answering moving on from discussing squad i would like to start discussing multilinguality now because we don't seem to have much time but these are the reference reads you should look at the slides and go read the papers for these systems if you have time or just read articles about these systems so stanford attentive readers and for attentive reader second version which is called attentive reader plus plus 
and one of the most popular systems bidirectional uh, so bidaf is one of the most popular systems you should definitely look at it please go through the architecture of bidaf and if you have any doubts please just post it to us let's finish question answering there now that you know the paradigms now that you know how the problem is approached let's start discussing multilinguality these are two very different topics but uh, if they are combined in the same lecture this is how i would like to start so you know that uh, we've already uh, said this quote i think once or twice that in nlp linguistics is the eye and computation is the body and if you look at the nlp problems in the middle or like ontology generation morphological analyzer a parser or a machine translation system the the problem of machine translation sense disambiguation sentiment analysis all these problems lie somewhere in the middle of linguistics and computer science and when you look at linguistics these are the different sub areas of linguistics which are used to try and attempt to solve these problems and these are the computer science algorithms or the methodologies or approaches which are used to try and attempt to solve these problems machine translation seems to be something that needs almost all of it not just the computer science based methodologies but some of the in inherent nlp tasks as well to be performed correctly for translation to be done now translation is one of the multilingual problems that is actually the oldest problem in language processing that has that people have been trying to solve for a long time initially ibm came up with a few solutions in the name of ibm model 1 2 and then there were different paradigms which came into the area of machine translation there was rule based machine translation example based mt and then you had the statistical phrase based mt and then came the latest neural before there was something called hierarchical phrase based smt as well but i don't think it caught up with a lot of people and then came neural machine translation which is the latest paradigm this is something that is very funny that i have been asked by a few of the foreigners i met so do you speak indian I, i don't know what is indian okay india has a total of 22 scheduled languages which belong to two or either of these two families there are actually six families i very recently learned so i can speak hindi punjabi english marathi but i can only write in hindi and english but there is no such language as indian indian okay so similarly many natives of india can speak and understand multiple indic languages but can only write a subset of those so i used to wonder why this is something that forms the very core of my phd research so this is a map of india i, I would apologize if i am missing something here but these are the languages that are probably spoken in the state so hindi seems to be spoken in most of the northern belt then of course you have gujarati marathi bengali telugu kannada and the seven sisters from the east and you have all of these indian languages the core of my research which is an attempt at multilinguality in nlp especially when you are trying to do deal with indian languages is trying to detect something called cognates which is shared vocabulary and also trying to detect something called false friends i'll tell you what they are so cognates are basically word pairs which from one language to another have a similar meaning and have a similar form or spelling false friends on the other hand mean the same across languages i'll give you examples don't worry just listen to me uh false friends on the other hand have the same meaning but uh sorry they have the same form or the same spelling but they differ in meaning so if you look at this meaning origin or meaning spelling matrix this is where cognates lie so father and pere is english and french example for a genetic cognate these two words came from the same source but they do not share the same spelling anymore 
which is not helpful for nlp systems but if we can detect that words like celebrate and celebrar from the languages let us say english and spanish or the words like ag in hindi and the word agni from sanskrit then we will probably be aim to attempt at solving machine translation or cross lingual information retrieval based problem or cross lingual question answering problem in a much better way because at the very helm of nlp is trying to understand what your query is in question answering or what your especially when it's cross lingual question answering remember we are discussing multilingual nlp so we are we have entered into a sub domain where two languages are inherently involved we are not just talking about english questions or hindi questions and hindi answers from the same language we are trying to see if a question was maybe asked in telugu but the telugu information retrieval data set is very small and you want to try and retrieve an answer from the hindi data set and then translate it in telugu and present to the user so we have entered a cross lingual domain now so remember semantics is something that is the, at the very helm of it and cross lingual semantics if it can be understood well by the machine learning models and detection of cognates such a task is performed well then the problem of machine translation or cross lingual question answering or cross lingual information retrieval can be attempted at in a better manner so these are the examples of some cognates ag and agni as i said celebrate celebrar from english spanish uh, and when you look at false friends the uh, false friends are basically i told you the words which mean differently but are spelled similarly so uh, if your machine learning model looks only at lexical similarity or a spelling based similarity it would probably say that you know what this looks the same to me vase and vaso whereas the english vase is supposed to be a holder for flowers vaso i think in spanish means a glass of water so these are pretty different when it comes to meanings and false friends is something that you need to identify to avoid disastrous translations i would go into my marriage is poison example <laughs> but then again my wife is sitting right here and she will beat me up so let's not do that uh, abhiman and obhiman are hindi and bengali examples which look the same but which probably mean differently in different contexts so just look uh, just go and search for cognates and false friends maybe you'll get interested in this problem these this is a very interesting example this is a false cognate and when you talk about false cognate what we mean when we say false cognate is technically words which look the same which may mean the same but their origin is different so the word saint basically comes from the latin side of saintly or holy but the word sant comes from uh, sat or the word such which you today know as such uh, comes from sat so despite the fact that their origins are different maybe the two languages latin and sanskrit maybe the speakers you know they <laughs> discuss some things and such words have come into our vocabularies but their origin is definitely different now since you want to solve cross lingual uh, nlp especially when you focus on look look i'm i'm focusing especially on indian languages here because if you want to discuss cross lingual nlp in an indian context with indian students i don't think i should go outside and look for examples from spanish or french or any of the european languages india has enough of its own languages i think trying to solve cross lingual nlp problems that have of our own should be our focus so this is a brilliant library when you are looking to process indian languages it's called the indic nlp library it supports quite a lot of languages and for what kind of tasks i am going to explain now remember we talked about tokenization something as basic as putting a space between special character and the actual word 
something as basic as trying to remove the special characters from the spent sentences maybe so indic nlp library is something that supports tokenization normalization by when i say normalization i mean uh, lower casing of english characters if they are present in the document along with the hindi or the indian language characters when i say normalization i mean removal of a uh, different ascii words which are present in the sentence so this is also something that this library supports for your nlp pipeline that you may want to create with indian languages then it supports word segmentation for quite a lot of languages it supports romanization which means your which basically means how you type so when you are talking to a friend in bengali or hindi for, per se uh, on your phones you type in roman characters right if my name is supposedly should be written in hindi the e ki matra but what i write is d i p t e s h so this is something which romanization means and then it has script normalization as well and script conversion as well so for example for my problem of cognitive detection if i want to compare a hindi and a telugu word and see if their spelling is same remember the definition of cognates spelling should be similar meaning should be similar meaning i will talk about further when i discuss cross lingual representations but when you want to check the spelling of two words across two languages they should probably be in the same script right otherwise remember denominator is different you cannot compare to numbers you cannot compare to fractions so to bring two language different uh, and in scripts at the same level what we do is we convert both of them into devanagari script so if uh, the telugu word says kuttu it would be converted into the devanagari script so this is also something that this library supports this is an example of english to hindi transliteration this is what i am talking about will talk to you tomorrow will talk to you tomorrow this is how it's written and when you want translation this is what machine translation does so there there's a the difference if you were being confused between transliteration and translation now that you know how to convert indian language words from one uh, script to another and you can compare those words using the standard uh, word comparison uh, methodologies or approaches such as normalized jaded distance or levenstein distance or maybe cosine uh, q gram distance you can you can have q gram distance so q grams distance is basically something that calculates n gram score among two words by dividing it into characters so again you can basically compare two words ka spellings using any of the previously available approaches but now when you want to talk about the uh comparison of meaning of words the probability distribution of whether these two words belong to the same sense cluster or not you have to have models which understand not just one language but both the languages that you are dealing with muse released by facebook is one such model which creates a cross lingual word embeddings model for you if we talked about word to vec we talked about fast text and i am sure you have heard the name uh, bert multiple on multiple equations but i think bert has multilingual models pre trained models as well you we talked about glove as well right prashant yes so these are all training methodologies which give you monolingual models so if you train a model using fast text on hindi sentences it will give you a hindi word embedding model if you train using fast text on marathi sentences it will give you a marathi model but what if you want a cross lingual model which knows the hindi sense distribution and marathi word sense distribution as well then you have to train using such a cross lingual approach as muse okay so what muse does is it brings your word probabilities from source sentence to a latent space for uh, so by source and target it can be any two by source and target what we mean here is any two languages can be represented as source or target so if i'm making if i'm trying to train a model for hindi marathi 
source can be hindi target can be marathi so word probabilities are brought into a latent space uh, for hindi language first and then marathi language and th then those two latent spaces are combined by using a simple projection layer and that projection layer how how does it know that these hindi and marathi words might be similar what it does is it either uses a dictionary which you can provide it and that can be the supervised method for cross lingual training or there is an adversarial method which is present with, with muse uh, and you can tell it to you know what do it yourself you look at words yourself you look at words which spell similarly and then create your own dictionary from those words and based on those based on that dictionary what you do is you create your own latent space so source sentences and target sentences are both brought into the same space by using a simple projection layer that is what muse does after muse there is supposedly a better approach to create word vector models cross lingual word vector models and this is known as vecmap it was uh, uh, initially i think vecmap was presented by artech and what vecmap has additionally is is a normalization uh more no normalization component after bringing the sense distributions into the same latent space and it uh, as an adversarial uh, as a unsupervised approach what vecmap has is it learns the distribution of two characters or two different words using the nearest neighbor algorithm so vecmap is again one of those approaches and then come your contextual embeddings which use the transformer based fancy architecture so xlm was something which facebook came up with initially and it was a trading methodology which could take in the corpora for multiple languages and give you a common model so, the, so see the problem with vecmap or muse is they can use any two source or target languages and then they provide you with a single model for two languages but what if you want a single model for multiple languages xlm is something that does that for you using contextual embeddings by creating contextual embeddings using the masked language modeling technique from bert but what it does is it combines so xlmr uh, what it does is it combines the optimization of the roberta approach on top of the xlm model that it creates so the cross the mlm objective here is similar to the one of the bert approach by devlin uh, but with continuous streams of text as opposed to two sentence pairs so the tlm objective extends the masked language so the translation language modeling objective what it does it it extends masked language modeling to pairs of parallel sentences and to predict a single english word or its french translation it is uh, what it can do is it can use the corpora of english and french and combine them and using the position embeddings of the target sentence it can facilitate the alignment of two parallel sentences and actually provide you with translations as well okay so these are the three representations that i wanted to discuss with you which are the most recent ones and which you can use so cross lingual nlp is basically in in its nascent stages and the methods are pretty simple and naive uh, so muse basically what it does it uses a sim simple single projection layer vecmap uses a single projection layer but it adds a component of normalization on top of what muse does and xlmr is something that combines the cross lingual contextual model along with the optimization of roberta and this is the end of the cross lingual representations side that i wanted to discuss with you overall what we have done today is we have discussed the question answering problem and the paradigms that have been prevailing in question answering we discussed different methods for question processing answer type and passage retrieval we discussed the squad data set and then we moved on to multilinguality in nlp and the task of cognitive detection so and after the task of 
uh, after I detailed the task to you, I talked a little bit about Indic NLP library and how it helps one detect, convert one script to another and detect similar spellings for two words and then cross-lingual representations, methodology, representation methodologies, which are prevailing nowadays. So I think that's it from my side. If you guys have any questions, please uh, unmute your mics and one by one, let's discuss them. Uh, if you have any in chat, please upload all the net notebooks of the lectures of deep learning on the Shala website. So whoever are the deep learning instructors, just post a message on campus wire area and I'm sure the instructors will upload those. Okay. Guys, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question regarding this. Uh, uh, we read two types, two types of, uh, of architecture, basically information retrieval and knowledge graph. So my question is what kind of architecture lies behind uh, or what kind of uh, methodology lies behind to extract this information? From which one? The IR ones or the knowledge graph one? Yeah, there's complex systems in which we are using both. So how do we integrate both and basically so, be... Right. So specific components, I, I think I explained that in a slide. Let me try and go back and re-explain that to you. Yeah. Uh, okay. The hybrid systems, right? Mm -hmm. Answer extraction. Why am I not able to find that slide? Okay. So what happens is let's look here. Uh, yeah. This is the architecture that we discussed primarily in the class today, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is primarily something that is used for IR based question answering. Mm -hmm. And once you have your possible relevant documents mm -hmm. from the indexed database, based on the query that you formulated from the question, you get some relevant documents, right? Okay. Then you get from those relevant documents, then you want to get some passages. And from those passages, you want to have an answer. But what you can do is in a hybrid system, using a knowledge graph, which has ontologies present, but uh, ontologies just look up ontologies are basically abstractive categorize categorizations of concepts. Okay. okay. So once you have your answers, you can rank them based on the knowledge graph ontologies that are present at in your knowledge graph structure. So okay. if, if you want the answer type as a person, you had detected the answer type here, right? Mm -hmm. Once it goes here, if the answer type was a person and mm -hmm. if you have multiple passages which contain different answers, then you have mm -hmm. to rank those answers and provide the user with a top answer, right? This okay. is where a knowledge graph can help you. And this is how the hybrid techniques, you can actually use a knowledge graph here as well. So okay. it depends on how you want to create a hybrid system of yours. You can use a knowledge graph just for answer ranking mm -hmm. or what you can do is combine the relevant documents that you have gotten out of the IR system along with the knowledge graph structure that you have and retrieve passages from both. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, I hope that answers your query. Uh, another thing is like this document retrieval for all these uh, relevant passages. Are these a classified system of neural networks? What does what does the technology? There are technology there are like? so many different architectures available. So basically, since yeah. 2016, yeah. 16, 17, 18 has seen a huge boom into the kind of architectures which use contextual embeddings. Mm -hmm. especially the ones which you would use BERT and, and there is, I think a pre-trained model available, uh, especially for question answering. And it's, I think yeah. known as BERT QA or something. Okay. So okay. the question answering passages or documents, they are especially, uh, used to retrain the BERT model. The BERT model is basically fine tuned on the question answer documents. So, okay. uh, look at uh BERT and BERT related question answering models. I am sure you'll find it. So just go to nlpprogress.com and look at the question answering page. I am sure you'll find everything that exists that is state of the art. Okay. 
fine. I will go through it. Thank you very sure. much. No worries. Sure. Anything else? The people are firing questions in the chat. Okay. Here it is. Okay. You have given it. Ritik has given an answer. Anything else? I think Prashant has shared the NLPprogress.com page with you guys. Guys, copy the chat before we close this. Otherwise, what happens is copy and paste it into your Gmail draft or something and keep it somewhere, maybe in your notes before we leave this session. Otherwise, you'll have problem finding all of this. I have posted the answers to your relationship uh, extraction tutorial, the questions that have been asked about uh, the links posted in chat, etc. So I hope that is okay and you've gotten everything. If there are no more questions, uh, Professor Amit, are you there with us? Mm, I don't think Professor Amit is, can listen to us right now. So guys, I think we are done with the session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to me. This tutorial, this lecture might have, this lecture might have seemed a little vague, but uh, I tried to club into very different things into a single lecture. I hope I've uh, done some uh, justice to it. I will close this session now. Uh, okay. I should pause share and uh, bye everyone. Let's leave.